Um, but why don't I just begin by asking you to introduce yourself and to uh, with just a few minutes to say you know, a little bit about your book on the Antichrist and so on. Um, but then uh, to tell us what it was that brought you into the study of Jung. So well, let the introduction be on that the, for a few minutes on that theme, and then we'll introduce it more formally later. All right. Well, my my, my name is Charles Upton, and you know, I've written enough short biographies of myself, so I ought to be able to do this. Um, uh, I was I'm 72 years old at this point. Um, I grew up in California. I was raised as a, as essentially a pre-Vatican II Catholic. My entire um, formal schooling was in Catholic school from nursery school and kindergarten through high school. And I probably got, in terms of a traditional education, a better education in Catholic high school than many people or anyone gets in university these days. You know, I got, got some, some idea of Western history seen from the standpoint of Catholicism, which is, is a, certainly a central path through the maze of Western history. And, you know, and, and the beginning of a sense that there was such a thing as metaphysics. So, you know, that it gets into you. So then, um, then uh, the 1960s came along and I heard the Pied Piper uh, flute of the hippies and I went into the counterculture and um, did what the hippies did, which, which had to do with you know, LSD and any number of, you know, short term experiments and different spiritual practices. It's very interesting. In San Francisco, you didn't have to travel the world to find um, spiritual teachers. They were all, and not, not necessarily the best of them, but somebody representing every tradition was arriving there, you know. Um, for Sufism, uh, my, uh, Actually, actually I, I was also, and, and still am, but let's say I was a San Francisco poet. And uh, that, that was my, sort of my first identification. And I was published by City Lights Books the, uh, uh, under um, um, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, who published a lot of the beats. And uh, one of my mentors there was Lou Welch, who was one of the Beat Generation poets. Like a lot of these people, ha had had a, a lot of, true spiritual insight and also terrible problems and ended up to be an alcoholic suicide. But, you know, I sort of feel like, uh, you know, he, he took that fate away from me, you know, he killed himself. So, so it says, okay, I did it. Now this is what you're not supposed to do. This is the kind of teaching I got from him among many other things. So, um, so anyway, uh, who showed up? He, he introduced me to, uh, the person we called Sufi Sam, who was um, 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 Samuel. What's his last name? Anyway, Sufi Sam, and, and who, who was was actually sort of a, a missionary of Sufism to the hippies. And he, he, from what I understand, he had more valid initiations from some order in Central Asia um, than uh, Pirvalat Khan or, or a Hazrat Anaya Khan. Uh, so it was interesting, you know, and, and then other gurus appeared. Uh, Swami Muktananda, who was the chela of the great uh, Nityananda, you know, I could get a shakti put from him, you know, to, to activate my kundalini. All these different influences, plus taking drugs, you know, very heterogeneous. And it, it took, takes many years to, if you, if you can do it by the grace of God, to make some unity out of all of those, you know, incredible impressions from different traditions and this and this. So anyway, um, after that, um, I went through a period of more or less leftist peace, peace movement activity in first the 60s, just as a hanger on, then in the 80s, when we were dealing with uh, Central American, uh, trying to prevent U.S. intervention in Central America and serving the, the uh, refugees uh, from Central America. Churches were involved, and, and I, my wife and I were on a um, board, um, governing board of a little Presbyterian church in Marin County, California, and involved in the sanctuary movement. And after that, I spent, I see a tour of duty through the New Age, basically uh, not quite believing in it, but interested in, in what's going on to see, well, what what has 
remained of the counterculture as we get into the 70s and 80s. You know, so we did this. And um, this went on for a while until my wife found a book of Fritjof Schoen in a local uh, bookstore. And uh, suddenly I was studying the traditionalists, and um, which is interesting because it, it was like a higher octave of what the hippies were doing. This is a strange thing to say, but to, to some people, but uh, you know, it, it was more intellectually rigorous and, and, and clear, but uh, that same impulse. I mean, how many things uh, did Fritjof Schoen have that the hippies had? You know, distrust of organized religion, interest in, in um, Native American spirituality, uh, interest in some kind of nudity, whether it be sacred or not, you know, was shared with the hippies. Um, and, and generally, you know, understanding that there were many different traditions which were valid, the hippies didn't, didn't approach this with any kind of intellectual rigor, but all that material was available to them nonetheless. So, so, and, um, so this went on until I said, wait a minute, you know, in 1988, this is when we were re reading uh, Schuin and the Traditionalists, I said, you know, enough of this, you know, every sort of, of spirituality, you know, continual and, and, and experiments with uh, what I can only call magic and, you know, sorcery and things, you know, according to the Carlos Castaneda method, if that is a method, just, um, you know, just playing around, hoping to do good, hoping to gain magical powers to do good, all of this. And I said, e enough, you know, I need a tradition. I need, so then, you know, the, the Namatlahi order under Dr. Javad Nurbaksh of, uh, out of uh, Iran appeared. And I just went there and I sat there for 20 years and kept my mouth shut because I needed to collect myself. You know, uh, I, I may have some, some disagreements with, uh, with their their approach, but th that's not as important as what they gave me. You know, I stopped taking drugs. I stopped drinking. You know, I was a, a probably a pretty serious alcoholic for a few years. I just quit. You know, and and I said I'm going to I'm going to stay in one place and remember God, and because and 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 not and not complain. <laughs> so I did that, and um, then after do uh, Dr. Uh, Nurbaksh passed away. Uh, I suddenly found myself through the uh, the help of, of a physician, Muslim physician I know in uh, New York, uh, connected with the uh, uh, silsila of the Alawiya Tariqa, which is springing from uh, who Martin Ling's called the Sufi saint of the, saint of the 20th century, uh, Ahmed Al Alawi, and um, that's that's the uh, Sufism that I'm with now. So I've been essentially involved in Sufism since 1988. And uh, after that happened, suddenly, and a, a chance to be a uh, political or a peace activist again appeared in an entirely different framework through the covenants of the Prophet Muhammad with the Christians of the world through uh, a book of that name by uh, Dr. John Andrew Morrow, who is. Uh, uh, Native American uh, Meti, which means you know half breed, essentially, you know, uh, or someone who identifies with both his Native American and his European ancestry, uh, came out of Quebec, uh, converted to Islam in his teens, and he wrote this book. Uh, but basically, he 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 rediscovered, and and continues to to, dis to discover just very recently uh, covenants that the Prophet Muhammad made with uh, Christians and other groups of, of, uh, of his time, which in the era of ISIS, which we're not out of yet, I fear, uh, was in immensely relevant because these covenants say, you know, um, the prophet under the inspiration of Allah commands that mu no Muslim until the end of time shall attack or rob or oppress Christians who are living in peace with Islam, or even prevent his Christian wife from going to church, and when when ch when churches fall into disrepair, it would be a pious act of Muslims to help the Christians rebuild these churches, and uh, and it is the duty of Muslims to defend Christians from their enemies until the end of time, until the coming of the hour. So, wow, how more relevant than that in times like this? So, uh, and and at this point, I am I am a. Uh, 
the, the unpaid executive director of the unfunded foundation known as the Covenants of the Prophet Foundation, um, which all I get from that is, is I, can, I can give that title when I'm, when I'm making a cold call to someone about some issue along these lines. So uh, that's where things stand, or, or they're not standing, they're still moving, but that's, that's where things are now. Right. That's that, that's that's the best I can do. So. Right. Well, uh, just to ask you to focus on the question of Jung and how it was that you became interested in Jung. I came, I became interested in Jung because <clears throat> the San Francisco poets in uh, the 1970s, mostly some in the 80s, in the 1970s, um, they were we were all reading Jung for some reason. Um, well, you, you, Jung was becoming some kind of slightly more formal approach to spiritual and psychological things than the completely scattergun approach of the hippies. So, you know, needing some degree of, I, I, I shouldn't call it orthodoxy, but, you know, so, some degree of, of established, uh, uh, con, con, you know, conceptual system in order to, to uh, make sense of our experience, you know, many people turned to Jung. And so we were reading Jung and, uh, Eric Neumann and Esther Harding and uh, Marie Louise von Franz and people like this and and it had something to do with in terms of poetry it was like the practice was you look into your psyche and you see what images arise it was called at that point the deep image school of poetry so you know and and out of this uh, hopefully uh, you know compose creditable poetry so that's what a lot of people were doing and that that's that's I, I guess that's the answer of how I got involved in Jung. I've never been in Jungian analysis, but you know there were a lot of amateur Jungians running around in those days, and I was one of them. So. Right. Well, you mentioned Maria uh, Louis von Franz. Um, uh, is that her name? Marie Louise. L Marie Louise. That's Marie, Marie Dash Louise von Franz. That's yeah. it. Um, I remember reading something from one of her books and being struck by uh, the difference between her and her master. Uh -huh. <laughs> it, it, she was much more respectful of the, um, the sacred within the framework of formal religion, and particularly Catholicism, yes. than I thought Jung was. Um, and also... Um, before I ask you to, to talk a little bit about the differences between Jung and, and, and I, I take it she was his leading disciple. Well, some would say that's what I feel, you know, about people, other people may have other names. But, yeah, my, my feeling about von Franz is, is uh, um, you know, the, 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 worst, the worst part of her was her Jungianism. She, she had this amazing, you know, s sort of a combination of, of a very educated and, and sophisticated knowledge of the psyche and of, of mythology and all of this and this, but but an almost you know peasant canniness that, that that perhaps came from her Swiss background. You know she she you know I'm I'm, I'm always remember things that she said which are so true. You know and then then you know, you read her books and then you see she's going into doctrinary Jungianism and suddenly everything drops, you know, to, to, to a lower level. And you say, oh, well, that's, I guess that's what she believes, you know, which, which is also of use, but uh, her genius did not come directly from Jung, it came from mm. everywhere mm -hmm. or from God. Well, the, I, I heard um, an anecdote from a friend who had engaged with the Jungians. Um, and he said to me that, um, that Maria Louise von Franz on her deathbed was asked by the Jungians, what do we do? Where do we go from here? Now that you're leaving us, we've lost the great master, you're about to go, so where do we go from here? And apparently she said that um, go to Corbin and the Sufis. Ah, oh. well, I mean, that, that's, that's certainly understandable. and, and um... Yeah, you know the the, the, uh, the that the Bowling Bowling Press was was publishing him, and uh, you know, I mean, the, yeah, the, the 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 imaginal plane, let's say, is 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 a higher and more accurate, you know, the Alam al Mithal, higher and more accurate understanding of what the collective unconscious 
is or would be. Ah, now, can I ask you please to elaborate upon that? Because that's a very, very important point. Well, Ibn Arabi, uh, you know, okay, to begin with, the, the imaginal plane or the Alam al Mithal is, in a certain sense, the world of dreams, the, the, the world of, of the Malakut, as it's said in Sufism, uh, the, the, the world of, of the psyche, of, of which, which appears as, you know, as uh, visionary images, et cetera, et cetera. But the question is, um, is this simply fantasy that, 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 that is not, uh, not worth paying attention to, or you know, what aspect of the of this plane is veridical? What aspect of this plane comes from a direct manifestation of the archetypes or the names of God? Um, and uh, Ibn Arabi said, "Well, there there are two levels, and I get this from from uh, William Chittick's book, um, whatever that short book is. It's really good. I can't remember the title now, but uh, uh, he." Um, it had two levels of the alam al mithal one is the traces of experience that, that are being you know reproduced in dreams which we all understand we we you know have some past experience or some experience of the day before which will arise in dreams and the other one is a higher level where the the archetypes or the names of god you know um, take place within the psyche within the imaginal plane as Living symbols, um, and it's it's out of this level that 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 veridical, true dreams come, and and this this is the, and if you can separate those levels, um, th- th- then then you can uh, dreams will provide you with the true element of the spiritual path and spiritual guidance. So. Right, and you you said that this <laughs> alam al mithal and um, the collective unconscious were in some ways susceptible of equation or identification? Well, th- th- there are two w- ways of explaining the same realm of experience. And um, the problem with the collective, well, the collective unconscious, to begin with, Jung, and, and he, he, he was never, um, he, he, he had different ways of explaining it at, at different times, but his his most common way of explaining the collective unconscious was, well, these are the traces of experience going back to the, you know, in, in, in collective memory, back to the beginnings of the human race and our animal roots and evolution and all of this. Well, certainly there are, there are traces of, of, uh, of past human experience, but um, that's not the most fruitful, fruitful way to look at it because it, the, the the value of the psyche is not that 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 it, that it is you know of understanding the psyche is is not that that you're collecting memories, but 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 that you're discerning truths. I mean, as as William Blake you know prayed, he said you know may the daughters of memory, the muses, you know become the daughters of inspiration, which means may, may we rise out of a sense of 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 the, the, this psychic world as simply traces of. Our own or collective past experience, and and see actual truths of eternity, you know, uh, taking place in in this world of images. So, um, so that, that that's a that's a better way, and it's a more spiritually useful way to, to look at uh, at you know what what dreams and and mental images uh, bring us. So. Right, and what role do the archetypes play in this? Now, I know we have to define what we mean by archetypes and so on, but can we just ask you first to tell us the basic image that we get from Jung as to his understanding of the role of the archetypes within the collective unconscious, and then ask you to critique that and to tell us how we might be able to integrate those insights within a framework that's more metaphysical and spiritually convincing. Well, that's that's the challenge. Let's see if this can be done. Okay, our, our, our archetypes are 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 dominance, the dominant themes in, in in human consciousness, which always appear in one way or another when, when we investigate, uh, you know, our psyches and how we interact with the world and and, and our understanding of ourselves and, our, and even our understanding of God. And they they are, and and generally, what are they? Well, you can. St- Okay, they are these. 
Um, we start with a shadow because the shadow is simply everything in in the psyche that you're not aware of yet. So, you know, th there's a point at which, you know, you, you embark upon your journey of, of, of psychological introspection, if not, um, if not, you know, true spiritual development. And psychological introspection is always important and always perhaps a beginning to, to the spiritual path. But um, if we think we're just looking at our own psyche or looking at a collective psyche, we have not yet stepped under the ground of the true spiritual path. It's very preliminary, but important. So the shadow is everything we don't know about ourselves. And, and at one point, it becomes like a separate figure. You know, th th this is who I think I am, but wait a minute, what's this? All these things I don't know about myself and about my reactions and my relation to the, to the world, my relation to the psyche, you know. So uh, that's the shadow. And w when the shadow appears, um, or, you know, w w which will appear in dreams, if you're on, on a Jungian path, you can call it a path, um, then you have to ask, what is not the shadow? Who, who, who then am I if, if I am not that shadow? Well, who you are is, according to Jung, uh, basically two things, which is the ego and the persona. Now, he uses the term ego differently than Jung and differently than many spiritual um, paths will, will, will use that word. Um, the ego is your self-concept, and the persona is uh, either how either how you wish to appear to others or how you will inevitably appear to others whether you like it or not you know how you are seen by others and how you see yourself so the, the, this this is these con uh, constitute the more or less conscious self at that point and then the shadow is everything that's not that okay and um so if you look into the shadow according to jung get deeper and deeper you will find deeper archetypes and that's next level is the syzygy which is the conjunctio oppositorum, or the, the union of opposites, you know, and then and this Jung finds that that you know pe people delve more deeply into the psyche. This is the beginning of of reaching psychological unification. Um, the, the opposites will appear; that they they will appear in conflict, they will appear in polarity, they will appear in union. The whole that whole realm of 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 of, of Oppositions. It's what the Hindus call the dvandva. Jung, you know, in in, in his uh, excursions into the psyche and and his, uh, you know, what he understood from other people's um, encounter with with their own uh, deeper psychological layers was at one point you encountered the syzygy, which is the the uh, union of opposites or or the polarity of opposites, you know, leading to their union hopefully and. Uh, so, uh, and, and this is something is this that is the process he calls individuation. Well, individuation is the whole process. Now, there's a whole question: What does he mean by that? Does he mean, you know, I I I become, um, you know, the the, the self sufficient Promethean individual? You know, uh, th th that unfortunately would be a deification of the ego, which is not what we want. You know, I, I mean, ultimately, individuation is is, is the, the the realization of the self archetype, which is which is basically the deepest level beyond the syzygy. The syzygy is the vestibule of the self archetype, the beginning of what you know, picture the, the psyche picturing what self realization would be, and then the realization of the self archetype is supposedly according to Jung, individuation. The problem problem is. If you do not accept that in one in, in one way uh, there is a divine principle, there is God who transcends the psyche, um, which Jung was very nervous about saying, because he says I'm a scientist and uh, you know I'm I'm studying the psyche and I can't make uh, theological pronouncements. You know, so he said this. Well, the difficulty with that is if the self isn't the Atman. The, the 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 god you know that dwells within all things you know which the, the Hindus see as the universal witness or as you'd say al shahid in uh, Islam then 
then it's going to be the ego. <laughs> so you're going to end up deifying the ego, and and so you lose. Uh, the the idea was, you know, the the individual has to to, to rise out of herd mentality and and come to some, you know, real responsibility, take individual responsibility for dealing with the truth and dealing with life, and not simply uh, live according to collective reactions. Well, that's a very good thing, but there are plenty of people who've done that who, who who have, you know, like Nietzsche, for example, who have deified their ego and and then fallen into the collective very ironically anyway, because that's what everybody wants to do collectively. <laughs> if they don't have you know a, a, some belief in God and some sense of what self transcendence would be, everybody wants to deify their ego. I want to be the only real person in the world, and so does everyone else. So you know, it, so so th there there's there's a there's a point where w without a belief in God and without without a, a sense of God's presence and and of God, what God requires of us, Jungianism can lead you to hell or will lead you you know lead you halfway or three quarters of the way and then then we'll, so mm. um, just to continue this point for a little bit um, towards the end of his life he gave an interview on. Um, English television, and he was well into his 80s, uh, and he was <laughs> asked the question, do you believe in God? And he said, when you know, you don't have to believe anymore. Yes. So yeah, I remember, what do you make I remember that? that. I thought that's what you were going to say. I remember that very clearly. And uh, Well, I, 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 don't, I don't consider that, that, that he was... Uh, he was lying to us. I, th I think he meant it. The question is, what what is um, what was true for him? Could could he transmit it? Could could, could he transmit it through his through his system and, and through his understanding? I, I have a feeling Jung's <coughs> preeminence and success as as a, a psychoanalyst had a, a great deal to do with with his own character and his own charisma not necessarily with his system why i've asked you to speak about jung is because of uh i'm just i've got ready all of the books that i read last year uh, when it, i was intending to have a whole chapter in my book a blessed peacemaker the copy mm -hmm. which i sent you um, yes Very interesting. Uh, i was intending to have a, a maybe a whole chapter devoted to jung because of what that wonderful pakistani um, member of the Zikri order in Pakistan, um, whose name I forget now, she did a wonderful analysis of the Taliban, uh, fundamentalism, and so on, using a kind of Jungian framework. And I was so that can certainly be done. <laughs> yes, <Yeah. laughs> the I, I projected very, shadow. I imagine that was a major thing. Right. Yeah. Uh, it was very, very compelling. And so I thought, well, let me look a little bit more deeply into Jung. And um, so I read, the, just to let you know where I'm coming from, I read most of this book, Lawrence van der Post, Jung in Our Time. Oh, yeah. Um, this one, which was very helpful, introductory, but very, very helpful, Jung by Anthony Stevens. Uh, then this one, Sufism. This wasn't so, so great, but some interesting points came out. Ah, oh, I haven't seen that. Interesting. Yeah, this has actually got, it, it sounds more interesting than it is. It's, it says it's got something from Pir Vilayat Inayat Khan. It, it, it wasn't bad, but it wasn't anywhere near as good as I thought it would be. Then this one, which I'm sure you've read um, by John Layard, The Lady of the Hair. Have you come across that? No, I haven't. This is something referred to by Kumaraswamy as one of the finest examples of, of applied dream analysis. Ah. Um, and he said that a lot of the, the value of this analysis comes from the man's um, anthropology. He's very, very knowledgeable about different tribal traditions. Yeah. But it's also within the framework of Jungianism. So this was very helpful yeah. as well. Then, and parenthetically, and there's going to be a lot of parentheses here, I'm sure, uh, what I learned about dream analysis while I was with the Namatalahi Sufi order under Javad Nurbaksh is that. Uh, 
dream symbols, uh, yes, they depend upon your anthropology, but w when you make a particular spiritual commitment or a spiritual, enter a particular spiritual path, uh, either rapidly or eventually, the symbols will line up according to the, uh, the principles of that path. So, and so, you know, p perhaps er earlier in my life, I would dream of a dog and the dog would be represent, you know, friendliness or, or, or you know, uh, reconciliation with nature or something like this. But when, you know, once once you become a Sufi, the, the dog becomes the nafs, you know, because uh, the, 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 the symbols line up according to the path that you're, that you're following, mm. you know. So just That's a moment, right. someone is. But Charles, uh, well, as we've had this break, can I just suggest something? Because we've been speaking for quite a long time, and I know that, from experience, it's always much more difficult to send longer things than shorter. So why don't I terminate this now? But then this can be the first, maybe we can speak again next week to take it further. Um, and so I'll, I'll set up another meeting, send you another email, okay. and then it'll be easier. All right? So yeah.